Okay, so I'm here, or not here, to talk to talk to you about uh, some rootkit work that I've done. Um, the, main, the main purpose of this talk, uh, talk is to talk about uh, Tron, the, the, the uh, Shadow Walker implementation that basically cloaks user land memory. Um, and then there's a couple other rootkits and an IDA plugin that will help uh, to obfuscate and hide a debugger while you reverse engineer code. Um, first, I think it's probably important to talk about uh, why why uh, no one's at the podium. Um, so this is a proof of concept talk. Basically, the idea is to prove that anonymous speech is now a technical possibility. Um, there are some social difficulties that may or may not be a, you know, a, a, a major, but we'll see we'll this after the talk is over. So to make this real, make this more realistic, we're going to try to break uh, the DMCA live and with just an act of speech using, um, using a property of Tron. Uh, this, so the hope is that you know, this sort of talk format may be useful for people who, related, who are researching DRM-related crypto or censored speech in the US. Uh, whistleblowers, I believe, recently had their First Amendment rights taken away, at least at the federal level, um, was the Supreme Court. Uh, also, it's also useful to help spread awareness of privacy enhancing uh, technology. So, well, so let's have a look at the DMCA, at least the relevant section. It basically says, uh, in pertinent part, that no person shall manufacture a component uh, of any technology that either has limited commercially significant purpose uh, other than to copyright protection, or uh, is, is marketed by that person for use in circumventing copyright. So I don't know, it seems like C would have First Amendment issues. Maybe there's some restrictions on uh, First Amendment uh, speech with respect to marketing, but uh, it's definitely a huge gray area. Uh, so, so let's do it. Uh, let, well, let's first talk about point B, I guess. Uh, do free research tools have commercially significant purposes? Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, certainly Linux has commercially significant purposes. Uh, lots of people use it uh, in their products. Uh, but if you have a free research tool that may or may not take off, may or may not see significant use, uh, is that commercially significant? Uh, that's not clear. So then what counts as, as marketing? Well, speech. Uh, how about, you know, what if I just tell you guys the truth? Uh, it is a property of this, this memory cloaker that it can be used as a component to circumvent some copy protection scheme uh, somewhere. So basically anything that, that uh, relies on verifying copy protection uh, of, it, of its code will do. Uh, all you have to do is you know, find, jump past the copy protection code and then cloak the, that, that crack and then ship it with Tron. And, and that should work fine for anything that's doing like MD5 of copy protection code or whatever. Of course there's better ways to do this than, for, than shipping a kernel driver uh, with your wares. But, uh, you know, it's a property of this thing. It can be done. Um, so, you know, let's got to ship the product, right? <laughs> put, it on the, put it on the bullet point. Put it on the feature list. All right. Um, so, yeah, so we have a, lot, a fair amount to cover. Uh, we have two rootkits uh, that are useful as reverse engineering tools. Uh, a rootkit support library that includes uh, some couple, a couple of interesting functions. Um, we have uh, one item. That, is, that uses Tron, the first rootkit, to set hidden software breakpoints uh, in your code. And then we'll talk about how all this was done, uh, how the talk setup uh, went, and, um, and all of that. So uh, I guess the goal of all this is debugger hiding and you know, covert code, mod user land code modification and instrumentation. So if you have something that's difficult to reverse engineer that's trying to detect debugger, um, or you know, trying to detect modifications or hooks in itself. Uh, the idea is that this, these, these tools will be useful uh, to that end. So this has applications in malware research, uh, working with beats like Skype, um, DRM research, online games, what have you. Uh, the dual debugger uh, trick presented at Black Hat uh, was very innovative, but um, also a little bit of a hassle. Hopefully that uh, the item plugin will 
uh, enable that to be done back in a single process again. Um, and, you know, DRM research, uh, I as an author am not liable I, if someone uses Tron to make a crack, I don't think. Um, I mean, so long as I don't, like, encourage them to do it and have a part in that, uh, them doing it. But uh, uh, the, the DMCA does make the component or part thing kind of sticky, so. All right, so the first rootkit, uh, Tron. Again, as I said, uh, basically a shadow walker uh, implementation, but made to work with uh, user land memory. So it, it's going to hide uh, various pages in, in user land memory and allow you to set permissions on them and, and make them appear to be something other than what they are. So let's do first, let's do a, a quick recap of, uh, uh, of virtual, me virtual memory and how, that, how this basically works. So memory is handled by uh, the memory management unit in your CPU. And it handles uh, the translation from virtual addresses to physical addresses. Uh, basically, these mappings are described in data structures called page tables, which uh, are a three-level data structure that translates uh, your virtual address to your ultimate physical address. And because of this, this three-level of it, uh, it, it, there's an optimization that caches these translations temporarily called the translation look aside buffers. Uh, there's actually two of these, uh, one for instructions or code and one for data. Uh, there, there's also a distinction between global TLBs, the ones used by the kernel, and user land TLBs. Uh, the user land TLBs are switched every time there's a process switch, uh, but not at thread switch. So here are the page tables. Uh, this is basically the, the layout of how a, a, a virtual address, referred to in the Intel literature as a linear address, is translated into a physical address. For your given process, you have a, a value loaded into CR3 that points to the base of your page directory. Uh, the first 10 bits of your virtual address are used to index into that page directory, and then that is used to get to the uh, page table directory, which the middle 10 bits of your address are used to offset into that. Now, what's interesting here is, is in the last few bits of here, there's a bunch of status bits in this in this table entry. Most important to us are the, is the valid bit right at the very end. Uh, but those bits are all ignored, and the top 20 of this, or at least for the purposes of address translation, are all ignored to obtain the base uh, address. The top 20 are used to obtain a base physical address of a byte page. And the last 12 bits of your linear address are used to index into that page. And that basically gets you your ultimate physical address. Okay, so let's recap how Shadow Walker works. Um, first off, you have, a, let's describe the idea of this page, the page file handle it's called. Uh, it's called if your TLD lookup fails, so if your cache basically fails, and then the page table says that it's either not present uh, or the page table says that the page you can't uh, write or can't execute in those last few bits of that PTE. Uh, that the MMU is what detects this and then calls your page fault handler. If, those, if, if all these conditions are satisfied, the page fault handler is not called at all. The, the uh, TLB cache is just updated by the MMU and it traverses the for you. Um, so what Shadow Walker does is it marks the, the hidden pages as invalid and then has a custom hook on the page fault handler to basically put fake or valid data in the TLBs uh, depending on the access type and the permissions uh, for that data. So if the, basically the, the checks are the instruction pointer of the fault, the faulting address, is equal to the, uh, or the faulting instruction address is equal to the faulting address, then you know you have a code access because it was your instruction that caused the fault and you need to service that fault uh, by caching the, the ITLB. And you do that basically by issuing a call to that page um, or the page that you want to prime for that address. And then you issue a move to that 
read from that page if it's not uh, an instruction fault. So there are some limitations to, to Shadow Walker. This is not me. Uh, by no means is this meant to be like uh, a knock of uh, Sparks and Butler's work, uh, but the, there were just some things it didn't do. Um, it didn't handle writes. Uh, the, the write bit wasn't checked, and if you had copy on write memory or write protected memory, you entered a default loop or a double fault, uh, and you had a blue screen. There are also races in the multi-threaded environment. This was addressed in their, in their FRAC article. Um, and they had, a, they had a, some, some scheme to get around that. Uh, in, in user land, it turns out to be a, it can be done a little bit cleaner. Also, there's no, there was no user land support at all. It was strictly for cloaking kernel pages. And in my opinion, they sort of uh, looked at this the wrong way uh, as far as this cache priming technique. Uh, I think it's better to think about uh, this not in terms of ITLB versus DTLB, like a schism between the two caches, but instead you want to think of it as a as sort of a, a schism between your page tables and what's in the cache. So your fake uh, data, which would be in the cache, and then the hidden data would actually be in those page tables. And then you can set up access permissions, and with this thought pattern, like an API basically just flows from this that enables code uh, and data cloaking. Uh, and which I'll show you in a bit. Also, I didn't really find, find it not so, I didn't find it that useful to hide uh, root kits. I mean, you're still hooking something. You're still hooking that page fault handler, and that can still be checked. Uh, you can still verify the code of the page fault handler. Uh, and in fact, PatchGuard is, is attempting to do this, but it turns out that uh, some subtleties of the way pa uh, PatchGuard works make it so that this uh, doesn't really, uh, or give you an opportunity, rather, to, to subvert it. So let's have a look at what hidden memory uh, looks like. Uh, let's think about this. So you've got, uh, in, in the basic scenario that I've described so far, you do have this, this view. Uh, you have a, a basically a two views of a single virtual address uh, range uh, in user land. Notice the seven. So you can basically uh, have your, your evil code in one view and then your normal code under the fake view. You also have the option to, uh, hi, uh, to hide your evil code or evil data or your instrumentation or whatever with, uh, with null closed memory, meaning that it appears totally unmapped. If you try and access it, you get an access fault, um, and uh, you basically can't detect it's there. So code permissions uh, basically uh, control who can access what data. And this is based on your instruction pointer, your current instruction pointer only. And so if you want to have like API calls, make API calls from allowed code, you actually have to give them permission as well uh, because it does, it, I don't want this back in a page fault handler. That'd be just insane. Um, so basically here in this diagram, you can see that allowed code is, is accessing allowed to access the hidden uh, memory, and then the other code is allowed to access the uh, normal data. Um, and then here in this, in this uh, null cloak scenario, you can actually have this self-allowed code that's allowed to access its own region of memory, and then fake memory uh, appearing totally unmapped to everybody else. So the, oops. The Coratron API. Uh, so all, all the APIs are, are implemented via a non-hijack of virtual alloc. So what does that mean? Uh, that basically means there are two 32-bit, roughly 32-bit keys uh, that are used, that are handed to virtual alloc. Uh, Tron detects this in the kernel and says, OK, this is meant for me as opposed to the kernel, redirects it to one of these APIs. The idea is that you can control the these nonces basically consist of a secret key that's your key to Tron and prevent people from being able to write the, uh, detectors into their software that scan for these APIs. So you basically have an almost 64-bit uh, secret key uh, into Tron. And the APIs are as follows. You have, uh, you have, have an add cloak, which basically sets up 
basically sets up a uh, a cloak at range from start to end, backed or faked by this start to end uh, uh, range here. And you can do this out of process. The, the fake memory is actually copied into the kernel uh, and allocated in the target process. So you can use your local stack. You can use heap and free it. It doesn't matter. Uh, and the, all the virtual locking and, and the cop, copy on write uh, elimination are done for this API. Um, I should also note that start and end probably should be page aligned just to keep yourself sane, but the, the kernel will page align these for you. Um, then you also have remove cloak, which you know removes your cloak, uh, eliminates any associated permissions that you set up below from that thing, and allocates any injected memory as well. Um, so then you have the permissions APIs, which basically uh, provide with uh, a range um, of code that is allowed to access a range of cloak. Uh, th these addresses need not be page aligned, uh, but the cloak, again, probably should be page aligned to keep yourself sane. Uh, and then remove allowed will remove that range um, uh, of allowed code. And you don't have to worry about cleaning up the process exit. Uh, I, ho I hooked a, a ZW uh, terminate process, and uh, that eliminates all, the, all, all your cloaks as soon as the process exits, and then uh, double check to be removed when Tron is unloaded. Um, oops. Okay, so we have a, uh, here's a core users example, which should be the craziest looking diagram so far. You have between, on this side, you have uh, a lot of code between A1 and A2. This is the, the uh, left side in case uh, mouse pointer isn't working. Um, so between A, A1 and A2 is, is going to be allowed to access your evil code over here. Evil code is allowed to access itself, and then other code is going to be given unmapped memory. And this is all done with just three API calls. You include the try and header file. Uh, you add the cloak to, uh, between C1 and C2, saying that it's going to be backed by null memory. And then you add allowed between C1 and C2 to access C1 and C2. Uh, and then you also add allowed between A1 and A2 to access uh, C1 and C C1 to C2. So to make things even easier and even more, a little bit more uh, helpful for you, uh, there's some convenience APIs, uh, you know, just to make your job a little bit easier. Uh, we've got uh, some high, high DLL by name and handle. These things take a uh, WCHAR um, or wide string Unicode, whatever you want to call it, uh, name, or uh, a load library uh, base address handle for a DLL, and then some fake memory can also be null cloaked. Um, and then hide that whole DLL, edits the modulus for you, and uh, uses and, and will use use the WinXP offsets in the module list to delete that thing from the module list. Um, because if you're working out a process, you probably want to uh, work with the the name instead of the handle version because of rebasing that could happen if you load library uh, from a different process. Also. Uh, say this now, permissions don't really make sense to allow one PID to access the address space of another because the only way you can do that is through the kernel, uh, through a system call. So we also provide our uh, write hidden and read hidden uh, uh, APIs that uh, allow you to access um, another process's hidden memory. Uh, so I, I, I mentioned a shadow walker doesn't really deal with uh, race conditions, so but, so that would imply that, that Tron does. So it, in fact, it does with a, with a little bit of help from the user. Um, so basically, the idea is you, you give, uh, you, you say, um, before and after your hidden code is running, you have the option of calling change of tr or change trust, which basically flushes the TLDs and will prevent uh, job-based scan from being able to detect uh, you on, on running on the same thread. So to visualize this, uh, if you have a you know, queue of jobs and you've got your cloaked code, you know that it's going to happen in one job, and then you know that the scanner can come before or after you, you don't want the scanner to prime the TLB with the fake memory before you access it, and you don't want yourself to prime the, the TLB with the uh, valid memory 
before the scanner accesses it. So you want a change of trust. Uh, you want to flush your TLDs before and after the uh, before and after your code runs if you have a job-based system that you're dealing with. Um, also, there's the issue of inter-thread scanning as opposed to intra-thread scanning, where you could have a dedicated scanner thread that, that, that could happen. And as I mentioned uh, earlier, context switch to switches between threads do not flush LBs. So you need to do something about that. So basically, this API is provided. You give it the address of swap context from IDA uh, in, order, <coughs> in order to patch this uh, Task switch, the task switch function in the NT kernel in order to flush your TLBs always and not just on uh, a thread or, a, or, or, or not just on a process switch. Uh, the reason why it's from IDA is because the NT kernel is rebased uh, on occasion. Um, so the IDA uses the PE headers, which are based at 400,000 uh, and are constant, and then the Tron actually calculates the real base offset in order to patch uh, this properly using, using the address that you give it. Um, and this uses some, uh, one of the APIs from LibRootKit that I'll uh, describe in a bit. So miscellaneous tricks. Um, as I mentioned, there's no hooking, uh, hooks. The system calls virtual query especially to lie about, uh, no, about uh, the uh, uh, virtual memory areas. Uh, the kernel also is not trusted. This is very important. You don't want your your uh, target app to be able to just reprocess memory on itself and be able to use the kernel instruction pointer to access trusted memory. Um, so that's that's a key uh, feature. That reprocess memory is going to give you fake memory. Um, and then and then memory permissions are also enforced. Uh, the write, protect, and, and what have you. Um, so. There are some weaknesses to try, and the first one really breaks my heart. I think it's the worst, the, the worst weakness, uh, and that's the hidden code doesn't run in VMware. I want to call this a VMware bug, um, <laughs> because their IRAT doesn't really doesn't uh, or doesn't maintain the ITLB. It flushes the ITLB uh, or its virtual copy of the ITLB uh, upon return to user land code. Well, this should be a perf bug. I mean, if, you're, if there's a page fault happening in your code now, they've got to also uh, do the translation for the, um, for the code as soon as it returns as well and, and get that back into ITLB again. Um, I don't know. I haven't submitted it to them. If there's any VMware people in the audience, maybe you could do me a favor. Uh, it would be, be really nice to be able to use VMware uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this. Um, but. Uh, data hiding does work just fine. Also, it doesn't really crash VMware, um, or maybe it does, if that'll motivate you guys uh, to look at it. Um, it, it causes a, a, a CPU hang, sort of. So that's the, uh, the, uh, VMware does remain uh, responsive for the most part. Uh, so as far as detection, there's really made only one major way I'm aware of, other than trying to probe the APIs to see if they behave differently, uh, which we did try to take care of to the best of our abilities, maybe we missed. Um, but uh, it, hopefully they should, those, the API should behave normally. The regular APIs I'm talking about, the reprocess memory, virtual query, write process memory, and so on. But uh, this breakpoint verification is also possible. It's basically the same idea that you have when you're trying to detect a user land debugger normally. You set a breakpoint, you install an exception handler for it, you jump to the breakpoint, and if your handler doesn't run, uh, you know that either a user Debugger attached, is attached and absorbed the, accept, the breakpoint exception, or something else strange happened. Uh, and in this case, the something else that strange happened is Tron is presenting a, a fake view of your memory, and the breakpoint is being written to the fake memory as opposed to the actual code that's going to be get executed when the code jumps to itself. Um, so this, again, this only works uh, if you're Presenting memory is mapped. If you have no cloaked memory that is uh, invisible, um, then you know touching it is going to is going to give you an access fault, and it's not going to be visible. Okay. Uh, so there is some room for improvement. Try is not perfect. Uh, not sure how much, if any, of this I'm going to do. Um, a lot of the, some of it is, is relatively easy. Like uh, so, SMP and, and HT uh, safeness is. Different. But 
probably a bit easier than 64 bit cleanliness uh, at this point. Uh, probably the easiest one on this list is the, the making the API uh, reentrant or thread safe. Right now, there's no locking on any of Tron's data structures. I just sort of depend on the fact that you're not going to be like running lots of uh, crack copies of software uh, <laughs> on your system at the same time, uh, or rather, more likely, not debugging uh, something that you also have hidden code, code in, but maybe that's cool. Uh, if that is happening, uh, I don't know, try and get around it some other way, file system locking, or hey, write a patch, lock down the data structures for me, and uh, I'll take it. Um, or if it bothers me, maybe I'll do it. Uh, we'll see. So far, it's not, an, it's not been an issue. Um, okay. There's also, now, yeah, so not 64 bit clean. There's a fair amount of 32 uh, bit assembly. Um, the whole page file handler is still assembly. A lot of that probably could be redone in C, actually. Um, but also, you know, you have to clear interrupts and and uh, and uh, some other nonsense. Clear the WP bit uh, in assembly, so uh, that, that at least has to be done. Also, I'm really sloppy about uh, mixing D words and T voids. Um, that, that's done all over the place. That has to be cleaned up. U longs too. Uh, they're all the same to me. Um, so 64-bit uh, and so 64-bit code is going to require that. Also, uh, a patch guard break probably will be necessary. Or you got with a freaking kernel debugger, uh, or boot in the safe mode, I think. Uh, that, uh, that's not very much fun. So um, that has to be done. So optimizations, uh, right now, Tron, on uh, every page file, is going to search all of its hook tables. So a couple of ways you can improve that uh, considerable hit if you have a lot of cloaks is if you borrow a bit from either the proto-PTE bit, which is used to uh, shared memory in, in, the in the Windows kernel, or, um, or shared libraries in user land. Um, that, uh, that bit can be, can be borrowed to, to try and hint at, or the reserve PTE bit can try and be, you can try and hint that a PTE is cloaked at Tron, and only, only search your hooks in the event that those bits are set. So you still have to search your hooks in the event of faults to actual uh, shared memory, but at least you'll eliminate some of them. Uh, if that reserve bit is available and not bug checked, uh, you can actually uh, eliminate almost all of them if they don't use that at all, but that's a big gamble. Um, and the, these things, I think, are, are documented. These bits are documented in the Reaculous uh, NDK. Uh, has those filled out for you. Um, so you can have a look at where they live, uh, if you're curious. Um, uh, also making the hook arrays and task tables. There's, there's, it's just a linear search uh, right now because I want things as simple as possible. At least make sure it worked. Um, it's probably not too hard to turn it into a hash table, and you can verify it with the linear search for a while to make sure everything's sane. Um, so that's that's doable. I may or may not get to that. I don't know. We'll see. Um, thoughts on uh, patch guard. So I mentioned that. Uh, Patch Guard actually enables a break of, or, or Shadow Walker to completely break uh, Patch Guard, which is interesting. But first I want to kind of rant a little bit. Um, I don't know. I don't think Patch Guard is the right approach, at least not a, the mandatory way that's being going, going about now. Unless things have changed, as far as I understand it, um, you need a kernel debugger attached in order to disable it. Possibly booting into safe mode, possibly not. I don't have X64 hardware, so I haven't been able to, to verify any of this. Um, but uh, I, it, it, it's basically going to lock out all custom kernel modifications. Anybody wants to play with their kernel and third-party scanners uh, as, as well who want to hook system calls. Um, it, it, but Microsoft basically declared war on the good guys and the bad guys, I think, with, with this move. Uh, kernel, people who want to understand the kernel for drivers or whatever, who want to, or who want to use the kernel for reversing other programs, or who want to do malware research to re try and research which system calls malware makes, uh, or who want to do the same thing with botnet research to try and infect, see if they can detect you know, botnet infections or whatever, or the same war. Um, and then, you know, Mr. Roof, reversing, as I said. You know, all these people, they're, they're all going to look for breaks, including the bad guys. And yet, anti legitimate antivirus is, is hooked out, is locked out. So it creates sort of a monoculture uh, solution where you really need, it's just break once, break everywhere. One thing that you have to worry about, instead of user land where there's multiple AV products that, you have, that malware writer, writers would have to circumvent, now you just have one. Um, one that 
break. And the result of this is going to be a stability nightmare. All these machines are going to, they're, they're going to be suffering from breaks. They're going to be bunk checking all over the place. Uh, I, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Time will tell on that one. Um, but in, in any event, it turns out that this thing does provide a, uh, a, a way to cloak your page fault handler, which in the case of Shadow Walker means that you cloak everything. Basically, the idea, if you've read the uninformed.org paper on, on Patch Guard, they do have another break. This one is different from that. That was also very excellent work, very brilliant work uh, by those guys. Very impressive. Uh, that's where I basically got this idea, since I don't have 64-bit hardware. Uh, basically, read their paper and thought of this. So the idea is you mark the start point, which is the default handler. Uh, Patch Guard, at least the version they looked at, used the default handler to start things off. It had some uh, moduli that it checked for that was special random value, uh, and that's card scan. Um, so you mark that non-executable, which is supported on your 64-bit CPUs. And then in your page fault handler, if your instruction pointer is equal to that default handler when it first starts, you prime your, your data table with a fake page fault handler uh, copy that conceals your jump or whatever in the, in the real page fault handler. And then you're gone. You're, you should be ghost. Uh, this patch guard will continue to scan, and uh, it, it'll read the use the, the GLB. There shouldn't be a, uh, a a context switch, and then you should be gone. Now, I could be wrong about this. Like I, obviously, I haven't tested it, um, and there may be ways around it, but uh, you know, kind of short on time. Don't really like the system. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Wait, I do that myself. All right. Okay, so ADHD. <laughs> uh, so ADHD is a device. Nice little graphic from the movie. Uh, also, side note, probably uh, another DMCA violation with these slides. Um, probably may or may not be fair use to use to use these images. I'm kind of going a bit overboard, but uh, you know, you all you have to do is use M Player to play that DVD, and then you've got another DMCA violation, which is you know, kind of nice. Um, all right, so ADHD debugger detection. Um, so you, uh, a few ways that a debugger can be detected uh, in, in, on Windows. You have the process block that has a special flag being debugged that can be modified from user land uh, to, to spoof. Uh, there's also a couple of library calls that check it. Uh, I believe this. The, I believe they're both. The first one is is a library call, and the second one I believe is a kernel call. Um, so, uh, but it can also be checked with a couple of lines of assembly. So hooking the kernel for this is not really an option, but you can bang out a win. Uh, query information process is a system call. You query with a debug port uh, property, uh, and if it's non-zero, then you've got a debugger attached to that process. Otherwise, you don't. Um, this, this one is really clever. There's this khakiwares uh, utility that uh, sets a, a, a little bit of a jump in these two uh, break-ins that are used for, for thread break-in. Uh, when you attach a debugger, it'll jump and alert it. And then you can check the, uh, the parent and uh, this last one will allow you to tr prevent exceptions from being delivered to a thread. It doesn't really hide the thread per se. Uh, it just prevents exceptions from being delivered to the debugger for that thread. Um, you've also got a couple other basic ones, more general. Again, the, that breakpoint verification or exception raising. Um, you also have a wall clock time. And you, ha you, you can check uh, the window titles and running as well. So what does uh, ADHD do about all this? Um, ADHD resets that PEB flag. It zeroes the debug port. Uh, it protects the debug remote break-in from hooks. It restores them if it detects modifications. Uh, it does defeat khaki wears and debug. Um, resets the parent PID if you've launched your process in a debugger to explore. Uh, it blocks thread high from debugger. There's no way to check to see if thread high from debugger actually succeeded, really, um, as long as you're being delivered. Um, so just deny nothing outright. This seems to be okay. Uh, ADHD uh, it does have some weaknesses. The re exception redelivery um, isn't handled. Uh, basically, every uh, all your exceptions need to be redelivered by your uh, user land debugger. I can do this for, for most exceptions. Um, also, time is not is an issue. You can't really hook those. They're done with shared memory now, probably for perf. 
uh, or timer resolution issues. There's a shared page between kernel and, and, and user that has the, the timing information that these guys actually read in most cases. Uh, so you can script your debugger. You can use Clue or whatever to, for trace points. Also, there's no process and title cloaking, um, but you can use Futo and uh, the debugger plugin, IDA debugger plugin Clue will do this as well. Oh, we'll spoof your titles. So uh, Lib Rootkit, uh, for those of you familiar with the movie Sark, and uh, he's, got, you know, he's staring at uh, what appears to be the kernel over there, I guess, and, and Pac-Man for some reason. Uh, he's running through the, through the system, having some fun. Um, maybe that's what annoys him, I don't know. All right, so no worthy Lib Rootkit APIs. Uh, basically, we've got a, we can, you can hook a syscall. Um, Platform independent, OS independent, uh, with a name, uh, based on this guy Gareth had a rootkit.com post for, for something like this. I, I cleaned up the interface, made it a little bit cool. um, Also, there's set up hot patch, which works kind of like detours. You basically give it a, a, a function you want to patch, uh, a, a, a thing to jump to, a buffer to contain the resulting assembly to set up the, the jump back when you, that you, you call from your target when you're done, and then the length of this. Uh, and it uses this guy, Nick Cappins, is uh, x86 length decoder, very nice uh, uh, length decoder, very, very minimal. Um, and it's also used by swap contacts. And there's an undo for this thing as well. And then these guys at the bottom, uh, TV borrowing uh, and shadow table uh, finding and setting interrupt vector or whatever. The TV borrowing is useful for uh, looking up um, or for getting a user land pointer to give the system calls uh, that you want to execute from the kernel. Uh, Clue is the IDA uh, plugin. Um, I think this graph here is kind of nice. Uh, this guy uh, basically hooks your, debug, uh, your IDA, is it IDA debugger plugin uh, to set hidden software breakpoints with Tron. So you can set, so it's useful so you don't have to just set, you know, your four hardware breakpoints uh, and, and, and worry about those and have to continually reset them. You can set as many uh, hidden breakpoints now as you want. Uh, I haven't tried tracing yet, though. Uh, it's on the to-do list. Probably. It should work. Um, the IDA uh, plugin API is, is unfortunately broken. Uh, there's four calls, add breakpoint, delete breakpoint, read memory, write memory, uh, and, and, and a few others. Uh, but it never calls uh, write memory. So I uh, had, to, had to use Microsoft Detours to detour write process memory uh, in order to hook it and, and, and do the writing to hidden memory to set the breakpoint. And it changes the item of Windows titles to random strings, kind of a little trick just to avoid detection. Uh, the warden, I believe, checks your window titles. Um, and it is a form of detection for debuggers. So talk setup. Um, so first we tried to make the orange anonymous, and then once we made the orange anonymous, uh, then we knew it was ready for a person. All uh, right, that's it. No. Uh, so there's several components that went into this. And the first, on this side, we've got a ventral client. We've got a voice changer, which is why I sound like some kind of like, uh, elf. Um, it's not actually my real voice. Um, we've uh, got a VNC. Uh, client uh, as well for, for the connection to the virtual machine. Uh, and Tor, of course, to route everything over and make, uh, to obfuscate the IP address. Um, so there's also a Linksys router involved basically for a firewall and a little bit of uh, uh, range for 802.11. Um, there, uh, it could have, could have just as easily been done with another VM on this side and a Linux host or, um, as we'll talk about a bit, uh, a, a Linux, a complete Linux solution. And then a VM image to make things easier on Hikari, who was extremely helpful in, in, in setting this up. Of course, it couldn't, the whole con couldn't happen without this guy. And definitely this, this, this talk would not have happened without his, his patience with my, with my random emails and uh, insane demands. Um, so uh, props to him. And he's uh, on the side as a VM image with a VNC server, uh, some tools and, uh, uh, and the slides, and then Trillo server and client for voice. And then lastly, you know, plenty of paranoia and uh, fuck the man. Uh, these are both necessary components uh, for this talk. Um, all right, so local setup. Um, you know, it'll do the live, and if you want to roll with that, you, you know, find a coffee shop, hotspot, you know, friend's apartment with open access point, whatever. Uh, change an address on the 
record your laptop and put the thing in the client mode, supported by OpenWRT, DDWRT. Um, Ventrilo has some UDP traffic that needs to be blocked as a reason for the Linksys or a, a, a Linux router ahead of you or whatever. Uh, and it also phones home, um, so you want to block that. So you basically want to block all but your Tor server traffic at the Linksys router. Um, you want to, and then these two IP cables will do that. And then you want to, you need to configure your Tor RC a little bit so to build fast circuit, circuits to Tor so you're not depending on, on just chaos to be able to get you a good link uh, to, to wherever. Um, and then, you got one, then we add a tunnel DNC and Ventrilo over uh, SSH-L. Um, and there's a little echo script that lets me know that this thing is still live, that's printing out times as well. Um, okay, so here's the setup diagram where all this works. Uh, there's only one Tor circuit needed because we have, we're, run, we're actually multiplexing DNC and uh, over SSH here, um, because this has been done both to make it easier for the Tor circuit and because they don't support proxy, so they think they're con connecting to the local server. Um, also, in, in the event that data retention actually happens and is competent, which is a big if, um, there may or may not be a global adversary in the future, in which case you'll probably need to do some extra sketchiness to make sure this 802.11 network is not close to you or, you know, it, or, um, additional fake flows with some of your friends into the Tor network. Uh, the big issue with the global adversary is that this talk is happening at a specific time. It has a relatively guessable traffic pattern, um, and it is going for a specific duration. Uh, this is very fragile to someone who's able to observe, say, the back backbone or Dan Kaminsky, uh, for, for example. Um, it could really ruin my day. So uh, you have, uh, on the other side, you have, uh, EVDO, and uh, the, the EVDO line uh, is basically what's the only network link on the display computer, and then there's a forwarded port to the VM image uh, that contains everything that I need. So this thing is actually pretty uh, mobile. It should be able to be done at just about any con. Uh, well, presumably. I don't know if my voice is dropping like crazy or not over the EVDO. It has a little bit of packet loss, a little bit of extra latency that may or may not be a problem. Uh, since Ventrilo is TCP, it is reliable, so I don't know. This manifest, manifests itself as crazy delays. Hopefully, there hasn't been too much of that. Uh, VM can be Linux once the Ventura client is done. Uh, this, there's a lot of serial number and update issues with uh, uh, VMware um, or with running Windows on VMware. Basically, you have to uh, get somehow get uh, a copy of Windows that do doesn't have a serial number associated to you on it, uh, and then you have to manage to update that so you don't get during the talk um, and uh, do, all that, uh, do all that stuff uh, without leaking any information about that image under the net. Um, that's very tricky. Uh, Linux would make things a lot easier and a lot, you know, legally safer. I do have a license technically for this VM uh, image. Uh, there's a, I've got a destroyed computer with a Windows XP home sticker on it still. Uh, that's my license for this guy, I'm going to say. Um, I think everything should be legit on that end, uh, even still. But uh, whatever. Anyway, so how, how do you build this custom Tor circuit? Well, there's this Tor control port that you set up with that, that uh, option um, earlier, that 9051 option. You tell that to localhost 9051. It's just a couple of commands. You authenticate yourself. If you set a password, you've got to provide it. Um, and you set, subscribe to stream and circuit events. You need to build this circuit first, which is basically a route through Tor. Uh, you give it your path. Um, this path can be any length. You can go crazy and make it like 100 nodes long or whatever. Um, and then you can you, you get a circuit back into success status. And then uh, when you make a connection to the Tor or to the Tor Sox proxy with like SSH or whatever, it tells you, oh, uh, there's a stream in. What do you want to do with this thing? Because you told it to leave it unattached. You then say you attach it, and then you're connected. You also have to watch this exit policy on this last node run down to the bell here, I guess. Um, but uh, I've almost done, I think. Uh, so the documents and tools, all IDA copies are tagged, so like you don't want to sh ship any IDBs around. Uh, I think people are working on trying to make those, uh, uh, working on scrubbers for those. Um, but the SDK appears clean. Um, it, uh, it appears to be non-unique for copies of IDA. So to build a plugin, you don't really have to worry about that, um, uh, your identity being leaked uh, through your IDA. 
copy. Um, so, uh, OpenOffice is um, used for the slides. It's basically, the open document format is just a zip file with XML in it, uh, easy to verify that there's nothing in there. And then even then, it's converted to PDF, so maybe this doesn't matter. Uh, Microsoft also has a metadata tool, but uh, I don't know. No thanks. Another license you also, also have to deal with in the event that you get owned. Um, try and goals try and break as few laws as possible. This is a proof of concept that it may fail. Um, okay, so uh, Windows Studio, um, you also, as I mentioned before, this auto patcher utility is great for updates for uh, without uh, having to worry about this thing uh, talking to the Microsoft update servers. There's also a, a proxy config option that allow you to set up a proxy for updates. You can use that as well. Um, auto patcher is just so much nicer, though. You just download it, uh, let it and then come back and get it later. If you screw up, you can just easily re-update later, reinstall and re-update later. DDK is free, but MS will only mail it, presumably to track uh, sketchy people like uh, me. Um, but uh, there are, you know, obviously ways around that. Um, set up, uh, and you also have to watch your symbol path and WinDebug so it doesn't query the symbol server for, you know, uh, tron.sys or whatever. You want it to search locally. And then all your research and stuff should be done uh, through Tor. You don't want to issue a whole bunch of Google queries for all this shit from a, give, from a single IP and Google cookie uh, would be very bad. Um, it would probably be one of the first stop shops for trying to figure out who, who had done this. I would guess maybe, probably. Good start anyways. All right, so anonymity. Uh, believe it or not, this doesn't hurt quite so much as it looks. Um, basically, uh, but there, is, you know, there are some issues uh, to this. It's easy to see. So even, even if you're technically sound uh, and you do everything right, your friends who you try to either enlist for help and who add other commitments or even those working with you, um, you know, they, they may not be as careful as you. Uh, they might post the forums or slash staff for their plus five karma points, uh, you know, to either defend your talker to say, oh, yeah, I know that guy, or, you know, post his anonymous coward or whatever without, you know, taking any other precautions to protect uh, who they are. Um, and then, you know, repeatedly visit the Khan website, uh, mention brag that they know the speaker the work, from a work IP or, or an IP that reverse resolves to with their name. That would probably be another nice one that I'm sure uh, can happen. Um, and uh, then the, these intersections, you know, the, it may seem like this is kind of, you know, overkill, but subtle intersections do uh, add up. Even, like, Buying a Linksys router is no big thing, but if you're already somewhat a suspect, you know, you do have the skills, and you did buy a Linksys router on your credit card or whatever, um, then that's a, 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 a possible way that, you know, things can go down. Or you ordered it online because you can't get the, uh, you can't get the, the uh, non-VXWorks ones anymore. Uh, that's a, another big problem. Um, and then, you know, mistakes during talk setup testing, if you screw up, let something leak out during a, 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 a test, or, or you, dis you discover something during a test that you've done wrong, um, that, that's um, And then, you know, basic other things, you know, slide style, someone recognizing your sli the way you lay out your slides, someone recognizing your, your code or commenting style, someone recognizing your stuttering, your ums, your whatever while you speak, um, that's another problem. Uh, and then from here, you know, the, the, the man can go round up all your all your your idiot friends who posted on the forums and, and give them a good rundown. Uh, I recommend that. I think that that's a, a good idea. Guys, could you could could, could you have a good time to? Uh, well, maybe that didn't happen. I don't know. I actually have no idea. Um, they wouldn't tell me. I'm sure. I just think I'm crazy, <laughs> which of course I am. Uh, so numerous uh, downsides. You know. You, no, there's no resume padding, uh, obviously, no PR whoring, so, you know, Greg Hoglin need not apply. <laughs> uh, audience is, you know, defined as a human element. element. Um, you, you guys I can't really hear you laughing, um, or if you're not laughing, or throwing things, throwing chairs, I don't really know. Um, and so it's not optimal. Um, so I have no idea if you're with me still, if I'm even still there. <laughs> um, also, you know, uh, I'm deprived of networking with others at the con. Uh, I, if I show my face, it's obviously probably problematic. Um, and then if I fuck up, uh, you know, it just looks stupid. Uh, or 
you know, maybe the thugs will come and break your knees, you know, some, some folks from Blizzard or Sony or whatever roll out and get my knees broke. Uh, no thanks. So, um, you know, well, closing thoughts. Um, is it worth it? Uh, yeah, what the hell? Um, you know, we're hackers, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do anything once. <laughs> it was fun, uh, very exciting, need to, need to try and prove that you could do. Uh, also helps to raise an awareness enhancing technology. You know, privacy may be dead or almost dead uh, as a talk tomorrow. Um, but, you know, as technically competent people, we can, we can build and use tools that can, at least tr can try and ensure some level of privacy for the things that we want to keep private. Uh, I think Bruce Schneier had a blog post that, you know, if you're taking a shit, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but you don't necessarily want to, like, you know, have everybody watching you doing it or, you know, you're, you're having sex or whatever. Private things, you Tries to keep some things private, um, and also in the case of of of, of, of civil disobedience or, or or just in the interest of, of spreading information uh, that would otherwise be censored, it's useful. Um, just to raise awareness of that, not necessarily maybe the speech idea is a horrible idea, but um, it'd be useful. It's, it'd be nice to uh, to be you know to be able to educate people hopefully about this idea. Uh, for for just general communications, and then if we say we're, we're relatively safe. I the we haven't really annoyed any particular corporations here. Um, they're obviously the ones who rule this, this government. So um, I think we're pretty safe. And even if we were in trouble, the test case should be relatively easy to, to beat. Um, and if we, if we fuck up uh, through other means, even still like social leaks or whatever, people can learn uh, from it. Um, and, you know, for DM research or whatever, um, whatever, maybe some talks about it. None. You can have a look at that. Wikipedia entry uh, to see. So um, that's uh, I guess that's pretty much it. A little bit over, but I uh, started kind of late. Um, but so hopefully everything's all right. Here's my contact info. I'm gonna try and be on IRC uh, temporarily. I might be on uh, 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 no logins uh, Silk server a little bit longer. It seems like a nice place to hang out. Uh, I hope that's not a problem that I, I mentioned that. Um, probably gonna be there for a while as Alan Bradley. Uh, free, uh, probably only on free node maybe for. It won't be immediately. It'll be, you know, like as soon as we do the takedown over here and, and uh, get someplace safe, <laughs> uh, probably be on there. Uh, and then I'll, the talk set of paper is not written yet. We'll try and post that uh, or a link to the Tor Wiki um, at a later date, maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, so look for it there. And then post. Tron is not posted anywhere except for the TourCon website. Um, just finish, you know, just put some fine, final touches on it for the TourCon release uh, just a couple of days ago. So we'll put it up on OpenRC. Uh, <laughs> Keep it. They should. I, don't, I mean, it's not really that big of a deal. Hopefully, <laughs> we'll see. All right. Um, I guess if this thing is still working, I can try and take questions if the mic is working, or um, we can try and do questions relayed over IRC. There is an IRC channel uh, open between me and Hikari. Yeah, since we're so he can relay, I guess. Since we're running late on time, maybe we should just uh, do questions on IRC. There's probably not much room for questions, I guess. If we're running late, there's only two minutes left till the hour. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let's, uh, yeah, why don't you just take the questions on so RC? I don't know, whatever, whatever we're going to do. Okay, all right, thanks <laughs> a lot. Is Torres still on? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>